all for coming. I'm actually not going to talk about labor today. So. Because the questions change. Wow. Well, my <laughs> questions have changed a little. Um, so some of you know that I spent um, some time in 2011 and 12 studying Occupy Wall Street and uh, um, with actually Stephanie Luce, who some of you may know, who spent a lot of time in Madison, and um, uh, another of my colleagues called Penny Lewis, who you probably don't know. Um, and that sort of led me to get interested in um, what I think of as a new wave of activism among young people, uh, so-called millennials. And I've sort of built on that project to look at um, a bunch of other um, <coughs> kinds of activism among that generation. And so, that, and I haven't given this talk before. I must say, I, um, I started by expanding, um, like comparing Occupy to the Dreamers, which I'll say more about. For those of you who don't know what they are, the Im immigrant, uh, undocumented young people who have um, been campaigning for uh, a path to legalization for themselves and their parents. Um, but now I'm going to try to expand it further. So that's what this is. And um, I'll see what you think of it. I'm very eager to have feedback because, like I said, I haven't done so this before. Could, one piece of feedback I heard that they can't hear you in the back. They can't hear me? Really? Oh, that's, that's unusual. All right. I usually am, I get the opposite complaint that I speak too loudly. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Okay, well, you didn't miss anything important. <laughs> um, okay, so as the title says, I'm going to uh, talk about millennials and recent protests among young uh, activists. Um, so, as you all know, I'm sure, young people have always been overrepresented in social movements. That's kind of a standard feature of most social movements, not all of them maybe, but actually labor is a partial exception. But um, and one reason for that is what um, Doug McAdam long ago called their biographical availability, which just means that since um, almost by definition young people are less rooted in adult responsibilities, they're often still students or not, especially these days, not yet settled in a career <coughs> or even a long-term job, um, often don't yet have families, they, are, they have more time on their hands. That's the short version of biographical availability. Um, but of course, it's not a constant that young people are activists politically in some periods, at least in the United States. There are many periods when there's not a whole lot going on in that arena, right? And we seem to be entering a period now where that's not the case. So I grew up in the, in, at the sort of tail end of the so-called New Left, the movements of the 1960s and 70s, and as I think you all know, those sort of petered out after a while, and then there was this long period where there wasn't a whole lot going on, and now suddenly we seem to be in a new period of activism. So um, there's a sociologist who long ago, uh, a guy called Carl Mannheimer back in the 1920s, was interested in this phenomenon that not all generations generate this kind of activity. Um, and he developed this concept of, a, of political generations as distinct from demographic generations. So, not just when you were born, but the kinds of um, historical events that occur in your formative years might shape your worldview in a distinctive way, and that creates a political generation. And so I'm trying to suggest that millennials constitute such a political generation. Um, so the standard definition of millennials is people born in the 1980s and 90s. There's a little bit of variation around that, but that's basically the concept. You've probably all heard this by now. Um, and I think the uh, financial crisis of 2008 was such an event, and there are probably others. Um, the other distinctive feature of this generation is that they're the first generation of so-called digital natives. Um, many of you in this room are that age, so you know what I'm talking about. People who grew up with um, digital technologies um, from birth. Um, I, I mean, I like to tell the example of my own son, who's now 24 and who learned how to play solitaire on the computer before he ever saw a deck of cards. That's like one trivial example. But So um, that turns out to be quite important in these um, activist uh, groups that I'm going to tell you about or that you probably already know about. Anyway, um, the, if it's true, and that we could debate this because it's relatively small certainly compared to the 1930s or the 1960s, but if we are indeed entering a new cycle of protest, it is one led by this generation. Um, so the conventional wisdom about millennials is very different from what I just said. It's, um, they are often portrayed in the mass media as selfish, lazy, <coughs> narcissistic, with a big sense of entitlement, you know, not a, not a very good work ethic. Yeah, I'm sure you've all heard this stuff. Um, digitally adept, yes. Spending all their time on the internet, 
twittering and I'm oh, sorry, tweeting, <laughs> so you can tell I'm not in this generation. <laughs> um, and you know, the way you've heard all this. Um, and until very recently, this generation was presumed to be politically disengaged. Um, as late as 2014, if you're interested in this, it's the Pew Research Center has done endless surveys of millennials. And so quite recently they found um, that millennials were, quote, relatively unattached to organized politics. Well, here the, the emphasis is on organized, I suppose, but even that, I think, is debatable. Um, so here's an example of the standard stereotype. <laughs> Millennials, if you can't read it in the back, are lazy, entitled narcissists who still live with their parents. Why they'll save us all. Well, um, all right, so there are some distinctive uh, features of this generation demographically. One is that they are um, racially and ethnically more diverse than any previous generation. You know, we're always hearing about how the U.S. is becoming a um, majority-minority society, and that's, of course, driven by young people. Um, they're also the most highly educated generation in this country's history. A third of um, those over 26 have four-year college degrees or further than that. On the other hand, as I don't have to tell you, quite a few millennials are carrying large amounts of student debt. Um, they're less likely to get married than earlier generations um, and less religious. And there's lots more one could say about all this. Um, again, digital natives. So the Pew people report that 91% um, of millennials, it's probably higher by now, are on Facebook. Um, they did this other thing a couple of years ago, comparing millennials to boomers, which I'll show you some data on in a minute. And um, in regard to that, they said that you know virtually every millennial they surveyed had taken many selfies, and that many boomers did not know what selfies were. <laughs> yeah, for some, that's probably changed since that survey, but anyway. Um, but anyway, the conventional wisdom is that this is a generation that's not really interested in politics. Um, and I think that, well, I'm basically challenging that here. Um, so the first sign that that wasn't the case was 2008 when Obama ran for president. As you may recall, um, this generation was completely infatuated with the man. Um, and not only voted for him in large numbers, in, as it says in my slide, the largest age disparity ever recorded, that may change this year, um, in a presidential election. Many also worked on his campaign. They, you know, there was this thing called Camp Obama, do people know about this, which was made up entirely of this generation who, you know, walked precincts, et cetera. Um, and it was also the first presidential campaign ever that relied very heavily on social media, which is not a coincidence. Um, so, as I mentioned at the beginning, my own interest in this was sparked by the phenomenon of Occupy Wall Street, which landed on my doorstep. It, I had just moved to New York a couple years before it erupted in um, 2011, right after some uh, not, somewhat parallel events here in Madison, I might add. I'm sure you know that. Um, anyway, millennials, as we quickly discovered in our little project, made up the demographic core of Occupy Wall Street as well, so that was another sign. that, um, And then I had already been doing a lot of research on um, immigrant rights movement and knew quite a bit about the dreamers who also by definition are millennials almost just because those are the people eligible for um, relief under the proposed dream act which I'll tell you more about if that's not familiar to you um, and now we see that they are also the core of the Black Lives Matter movement and um, the fourth one I'm going to talk about briefly here is um, the campus movement protesting sexual violence sexual assault which is um, Again, well, students of, by definition, this generation. Um, and then, of course, as you all know, in, in the last few months, we've been hearing a lot about millennials in the context of Bernie Sanders' campaign, which has won um, extraordinary support from them. Uh, this is just one example um, of the kind of polling data that's out there comparing Sanders and Clinton's support among um, millennials. And uh, related to that, um, as one headline, I forget where I saw this read, millennials are fine with socialism, whatever that means. I'll come back for that. Um, so here's some data from Pew on the political attitudes of millennials compared to boomers, baby boomers, my generation basically. I think we have both groups well represented in this room. <laughs> so, um, so you can see that um, on most measures, uh, Millennials are to the left of their elders, so um, they are um, 
less likely to see the two major parties as meaningfully distinctive. They are less likely to see themselves as patriotic. They are more likely, this is the standard thing, to support gay rights, but as you can see, the po political differences go way beyond that. That was the first thing that kind of surfaced, especially support for same-sex marriage. Legalization of marijuana, immigrant rights. Bigger government might surprise you for a group that's supposedly politically disengaged and mainly interested in tweeting. Um, and then finally have a positive view of socialism. I have a pet theory about this for which I have no evidence, but I'll tell you anyway, which is that in 2008 when Obama was running for president for the first time and the um, right wing were trashing him and saying he was a socialist. And as my mother would say, what do millennials know from socialism? You know, they were born at the, after the Cold War was over anyway, you know, talking at least after that. And so, um, but if, Obama, who people fell in love with at that time, was a socialist, maybe that was okay. So, I, I don't know if this has any real content, but we're now seeing it again with the Sanders campaign. Anyway, for those of us who um, do have a positive view of socialism, this is sort of a remarkable development, so that's why I dwell on it, but I don't really have any data about The 25% is impressive, too. That's true. Yeah, and that's probably grown since. This, was, this is from 2010, 2011, right after Obama. I haven't seen, there, I'm sure there are more recent polls, but I don't have them here. Um, okay, so whoops, what happened here? Sorry about that. Um, what that's supposed to say is that college, I, I just was tweaking this PowerPoint right before I came here, so I'm sure there are going to be other errors. College educated millennials um, are more progressive than, uh, I was able to get some of the unpublished Pew data, they don't have to publish this, but if you look at it by education, they're even you know, more to the left or whatever than millennials generally. And it's also true according to um, research by Kathy Cohen and um, some of her colleagues. Kathy Cohen at the University of Chicago, who's written a lot about Black Lives Matter and heads. Um, uh, what is it, BL? Anyway, a big organization of millennials as well, though she's from my age, I think, um, has shown that um, millennials of color are also more progressive, blacks and Latinos in particular. Um, so, but education is a driver of this as well. Um, okay. So I. I also want to mention um, how this all connects to the Great Recession, not only because this, the package of these two talks was under that frame, but I do think it's quite important. Um, that is the sort of formative event, I think, for this political generation a la Mannheim. Um, so as, um, so the 2007-2008 recession and the crash of 2008 came just as many millennials were entering the labor market for the first time. And, that meant they were disproportionately affected by the crisis. Um, and actually for the college educated group, which I'm mostly interested in here because they're the protagonists of all these movements I'm going to talk about, um, they were less likely to be unemployed. College educated youth were not unemployed that much, but they were dramatically underemployed. Um, and so that's again biographical availability. Um, not as many hours as um, they would have liked to be working in many cases, and also at jobs for which they were overqualified. <coughs> um, also, you know about student debt. I won't belabor that, but you know that's another factor which was just aggravated further by the crash. Um, and of course, the, it's not just the events of 2007, 2008, and that spike in unemployment and underemployment, but the longer-term growth, and this, um, this sort of came up yesterday too, um, of precarious employment, as many people now call it, has affected this generation disproportionately for obvious reasons. So, so there's that whole uh, background to the story. And, um, so, and I think this is not insignificant in sparking the activism, as I'll try to explain. So there's a book that some of you might have run across by Paul Mason, who's a journalist for the BBC. Um, it's called Why It's Still Kicking Off Everywhere. There's, actually, there's a second edition called Why It's Still Kicking Off Everywhere. And it's about social movements around the world from the Arab Spring to the Indignados, et cetera, including Occupy Wall Street. And um, he argues that all these movements are driven by what he calls the graduate with no future. So that may be a little bit of hyperbole, um, at least in the United States, but um, I think there's a lot to that. That, you know, this sort of, you know, you do everything right, everything you're told to do, you go to college, you get good grades, blah, 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 and then you face this labor market. Um, in the US version, and of course it's much more extreme in Southern Europe or Egypt or somewhere like that. Um, so I already mentioned the biographical availability point. Um, 
Another thing was, so there's sort of economic disappointment, if you will, and also political disappointment after 2008. So this is a generation infatuated with Barack Obama prior to his presidency, and then in many cases deeply disillusioned by what follows um, in terms of, the, you know, where is that change that he promised. Um, so again, I'm suggesting this is a new political generation, and maybe as um, the, another journalist, Peter Beinart, has argued in a piece that influenced my thinking a lot, maybe a new, new left. Um, that, I know that's, there's not, I can't sustain a case for that, but I think there's growing evidence that there might be something there. Um, so I'm going to talk about four movements among this generation. I already told you what they are. The Dreamers, this is sort of in vaguely chronological order. The Dreamers actually precede Occupy Wall Street. Um, the Dreamers occupy um, the movement against sexual violence and Black Lives Matter. Um, and now they overlap chronologically, but that's more or less the sequence in time. Um, and of course, they each have independent roots, but they have um, also built on one another, learned from one another, drawn energy from one another. In one um, interview I did with an activist in the sexual assault movement, she said on her campus, they talked about the spring of our discontent and, there were, and you know, the year she became involved in that. that was, all these things were happening at the same time. Um, all four, although some more than others, use the language of intersectionality, which um, drips off the tongue of this generation like it was a word for water or something. I mean, it's just sort of a normal word. I don't know if some of us um, came across this in academia, but it's just a regular vocabulary word for like any other for this generation, whether they're political or not, um, but especially for the activists. Um, so anyway, I think these four movements, and you know, we can name some others that are maybe less prominent, but that are out there, are part of this potential, well, maybe, cycle of protest. Um, launched by this generation. Um, so let me say a little bit about what they have in common, a little bit about how they vary, and then I'll say a little bit about each one and then we can talk. Um, so a few common features that all four share. One is heavy use of social media, not surprisingly. Um, Manuel Castells wrote at some point that Occupy was born on the internet, diffused by the internet. That was sort of the first time that this really became uh, something that a lot of people noticed, though I think it started before that even with the dreamers. Um, also, this is really an Occupy point. Um, the use of social media also allowed um, these movements to, to triumph over traditional hierarchies in various ways, and especially over the police initially. This is probably not true anymore. But in 2011, when Occupy first emerged, the, the police had no clue how to deal with all the social media communications. And so they were able to, the, the activists were able to stay ahead of the surveillance and the, um, and and the police activity um, to some extent. But again, that's probably no longer the case, but it, it was in the beginning. Um, I, even though uh, social media has been really important in all four of these movements and probably others, um, it's, uh, that's not to say that face-to-face -face interactions were not important. They were, and all the people I've talked to about this will assert that. So there, it's a combination. Um, all these movements had some, again, the amount varies, mentoring from older activists, although they accepted pieces of what they were told and rejected other pieces. Um, man, most, again, some more than others, frame their issues in this language of intersectionality. And virtually all of them see their work as part of a bigger effort. Not Even if they're working on one issue, say sexual violence, they understand it as part of a bigger... Um, I don't think the phrase that was used in the 1960s, the movement is so much used today, but th th there's more talk about allies and that kind of thing. But people see themselves as part of something bigger than whatever they're working on in particular. And it's, what's really striking is how um, college-educated millennials dominate all this stuff. Um, and I have some systematic data on that, and some of it's more impressionistic, but it seems pretty clear that that's the case. Um, so again, all four of these movements are rooted in disappointed expectations. Economic, I already mentioned, political, post-Obama, and also social expectations, because this is supposed to be, you know, after 2008, we have an African-American president for the, this historic achievement. It's supposed to, supposedly a post-racial society, and then we see these murders of, uh, you know, African-Americans continuing in the streets by the police. Um, and supposedly all the problems of gender inequality have been solved by my generation, and yet people are getting raped on campuses all over the country, right? I mean, women, that is. So, men too, I guess, here and there. But anyway, so th there's that disappointment or, you know, uh, smashed expectation as well. Um, so 
Now, this next part I'm still fiddling with, so I'd be very interested in your um, comments. But um, these movements also vary in some key ways. So I, this is just one of the acts. There's other things one could do, but this is the thing that strikes me as the most important. So it's a little complicated. Let me just walk you through this. So there's these four movements that I mentioned. And two of them, Occupy and the Movement Against Sexual Violence, are basically led by mostly white people, mostly quite privileged millennials. Um, I'll give you some evidence for that in a little while, but that's pretty clear. By definition, because of skin color, among other things, um, so they're insiders. They're, you know, to the matter board, so to speak. They're, they were supposed to get all the goodies that the society has to offer. Maybe they're not getting them, but that was the expectation. For the Dreamers and Black Lives Matter activists, by definition, they're outsiders. They're people of color, for the most part. Um, many are women, and many are queer. This is very, I don't know why this is, and I'd love to hear your insights into it, but it's very striking in those two movements especially, and some people suggest it's also true, amazingly, of the uh, anti-sexual assault women. Um, they're disproportionate, they're all women, pretty much, but. Anyway, in these two, disproportionately queer. So there's a way in which the insiders are saying, you know, we, like I said before, we did everything right. We went to college. We did this. We did that. We prepare ourselves to be leaders in the society, and and yet we're being rejected. And the outsiders are sort of the opposite. They're they're also college educated, and you know, the new they're the kind of first generation in many cases um, to be college educated. They also did everything right, and they can't get in. So there's that contrast on the one side. And also, in terms of those strategies that these movements use, they're very, um, there's a different angle, which is what the other axis here is, um, which I don't know, this may be too confusing to use inside and outside twice, but the, the Occupy and Black Lives Matter are anti-systemic movements. They are, um, they're not interested in small reforms. They're interested in changing the society in a fundamental way. Um, and, so we could call that, I don't know, this is really important from the labor movement language, the outside game. They are not, um, you know, spending a lot of time lobbying Congress people. They are, um, and in the case of Occupy, they completely reject all that. Black Lives Matter is a little more split on it, but many of them also reject it. They are trying to change the, you know, fundamental social structure in a way that isn't easy to do. Um, these other two are much more focused on specific demands, and they've actually won quite a lot um, along those lines. So there, that's the insight game. And they use different tactics as a result. So the Occupy and Black Lives Matter are much more focused on direct action um, and reject the kind of conventional politics, whereas these two movements are working inside the system, so to speak, um, trying to get laws passed, things like that. And they do a lot of lobbying and that sort of thing. So, well, OK, so that's my map of the four. but. Um, and I used to think, I have to say, I started this by looking just at the dreamers and Occupy, and I thought maybe there was some uh, connection between the strategies and the insider-outsider thing over here, but that falls apart once you add the other two. So I'm not quite sure what this adds up to, but that's what I'm playing with, so I'll be very curious to hear your um, thoughts. Um, okay, so now I just want to say a little bit about each one. Some of you may already know a lot of this, but because I don't have that much time, so I'm just going to sketch them very quickly. But um, so let me start, like I said, in chronological order with the dreamers. Um, so again, these are outsiders, uh, undocumented youth, by definition, are outsiders, but focused on um, um, reform. So if they're called dreamers because of this piece of legislation that was proposed some years back, which doesn't seem like it's ever going to pass, called the Development Relief and Education for Alien Minors, a really catchy title, Act, um, which would have... Um, which would, if ever it were passed, um, give a path to legal status for undocumented young people. Um, they have to meet certain requirements under that proposed law to get status. Um, most have to have, um, most, most of the activists in the Dreamers movement have college education, at least a few years. Many of them are college graduates now. Um, and the Dream Act actually requires some college education, although the alternative is military service. No comment. Um, a lot of the organizing for the Dreamers, I actually first encountered this, I used to teach at UCLA, which is one of the places where this was, you know, that's sort of, Los Angeles is sort of headquarters for the undocumented population generally, and UCLA was one campus where there was a tremendous amount of activity around this issue, but it's spread all, all over um, 
the country in areas where immigrants are present. Um, and mostly started on college campuses, but more and more as the time has gone by, this, this movement's been around for a while, um, more and more of them have graduated and um, joined the ranks of Paul Mason's graduates with no future, you know, they, in a very extreme way, because, you know, under U.S. law, undocumented um, people can go to school indefinitely, um, although co college is a little complicated in terms of fees and everything else, we'll, we'll see, but, um, but they can't work legally. So they really are the graduate with no future if they manage to get through college. Um, many did take advantage of DACA, which is which I'll say more about in a minute, which is the one of the their big victories. DACA is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival. So they, the Dream Act has never passed, but um, that was an executive order that um, Obama issued and um, gave um, them temporary deferrals of from deportation and so on. So in the, so that's well, and that's so then they have a little bit of a future. Um, this is an extreme case of biographical availability, if you will, um, given what I just said about the lack of um, options in terms of employment. Um, one commentator wrote, the dreamers are stuck. In other words, they're caught in between it. They can go to graduate school, they can ep endlessly, but employment is another matter. Um, it's bad for them, but it's good for organizing, as this person commented. Okay. Um, so one of the strategies that the dreamers really relied heavily on is what um, people like Francesca Perry and other social movement scholars call storytelling. That was like a really central strategy for them from the outset. They were explicitly trained in telling their stories to the media. The idea was that this was the group of undocumented immigrants that could win public sympathy and media attention the most easily. Um, so there was a sort of standard narrative that was um, presented regularly that these were people brought to the U.S. by their parents as young children. It was not their choice. Their parents did this. Um, so they're not, quote, truly illegal in the way, implying that their parents were, which they later changed their minds about. But they are, they are as American as apple pie. They grew up here. They don't remember the country they were born in. They don't necessarily speak the language very well. Um, the standard story is they first learned about their undocumented status when they graduated from high school and found out that they couldn't apply for financial aid because they didn't have a social security number, this kind of thing. Um, of course, this is not true of all undocumented young people, but it is true of some. And these are the stories that were lifted up. Um, there's a lot of flag waving. Um, many of them, you know, the ones that are the chosen storytellers were the valedictorian in their high school, et cetera. So they're like the model citizens. Um, they take some inspiration from the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s, and also, as we'll see, the, um, uh, the LGBTQ movement. Um, here's a typical dreamer narrative. Growing up, I did not have any friends who were undocumented, and I was unaware of my immigration status until I was 15. When I was 15. When I was 15, I decided it was time to get a job. My parents did not have a lot of money, and I wanted to buy things for myself. It was at this time that my parents notified me that I could not get a job because I had not been born in this country. Um, and then she talks about working under the table. Um, I worked very hard in school, earned good grades, but I felt humiliated. It was very hard to realize that even though I felt like a young American and had been educated entirely in this nation, my immigration status limited my options and ultimately how I could live my life. So that's kind of a typical story. Um, well, and that, that is how it all started. So the idea was this was going to somehow carry the train of comprehensive immigration reform. You know, this was the most sympathetic possible narrative that that would win the hearts and minds of the American public, but that didn't happen. And as time went on, the dreamers um, graduated from college and grew up and became increasingly impatient with the idea that this was the only narrative, A, and that they were supposed to wait endlessly while um, comprehensive immigration reform dragged on and on. Um, so they changed quite a bit and became more radical and more edgy. and. Um, and began to embrace their parents. They rejected this old narrative as saying, you know, my parents were, you know, somehow doing something wrong by bringing me to the United States. They said, no, they were, they just wanted a better life for themselves and for me. This was okay. And, um, and they became more militant and started engaging in direct action stuff, occupying um, detention facilities, occupying congressional offices, uh, blocking intersections, stuff like that. And a lot of them um, came out as queer, and as this poster suggests. Um, there's a, a former student of mine and now teaching at UC Santa Cruz, Veronica Terricas, who's written a lot about um, 
the undocu-queer <coughs> movement. So, you know, we don't have like super great statistics on this, but a lot of the most prominent leaders in this movement identify as queer, and the posters like this, they flaunt it, you know, as this is who they are. Um, and they use the metaphor of coming out sexually as um, parallel to coming out as undocumented. So you've probably run into this yourselves in the media, these you know, young people who announce to the world that they are undocumented and proud and so on. So that, um, even before DACA. So, okay, so despite all that, this is a movement that's basically conventional in its political form. They, um, their organizations have elected leaders. They vote to make decisions on the implicit contrast here is to occupy, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, they lobby. They're looking for very specific things. The DREAM Act itself, driver's licenses for undocumented people, in-state tuition, financial aid. Um, again, as I mentioned, there have been some direct actions too, but most of their activity is pretty conventional. And they have won quite a few concessions in state college tuition in quite a few states. I don't know about Wisconsin. No? Yes? What's the story here? I'm not sure. California was the first big triumph, but there's, anyway, there's, and then financial aid, even access to financial aid in a few states as well, which is a really big deal. Because before they could get in-state tuition, but they still have to pay for it, and they're from very poor families mostly. Um, the big victory was, da was DACA, which um, offers temporary um, work permits and protection from deportation, and over half a million young people have taken advantage of that. Um, you probably know that um, there was supposed to be an expansion of DACA and something called DAPA, Deferred Oh dear, I'm not going to remember what it stands for. Deferred action for parents of, I'm not sure what the people, anyway, it's for adults. Well, basically their parents under certain conditions could also get deferred action. So Obama issued an executive order for all this, um, but then it was, um, it's tied up in the courts, actually at the Supreme Court right now because Texas and a bunch of other states sued and said that Obama did not have the authority to issue such an executive order, even though he had done it already with the first DACA. And, um, I don't know with the four to four court what will happen with that, but there's supposed to be a decision coming soon. Um, so they have want, they've been pretty successful, this movement, even though they never achieved the DREAM Act itself. Um, on the other hand, they completely failed to change the narrative despite, you know, all that training and storytelling and everything. Like, as we know, the polarization of the country over undocumented immigration, especially in this presidential campaign, is, remains, you know, blatant. So, Okay, I'm just going to move on to Occupy. Um, so Occupy is the a sort of different story. These are insiders, as I tried to argue before. Um, and I'll give you some data showing that in a minute. But they're not interested in playing the standard political game. Instead, they're, you know, they reject all that. Who are they? So in our project um, that I mentioned at the beginning, we did a, um, I guess it's the only um, attempt at a representative survey of Occupy. There are a few other surveys that were done on the web which find more or less the same thing. But anyway, we found the following that, um, and this was based on a survey of a major Occupy demonstrator, people who participated in a major Occupy march in New York. Um, they were, we compared them to New York City residents, which is, you know, who was in the <coughs> population that they were drawing from in the march. 72% were college educated, roughly t double the um, level in New York. They were largely white. Again, double the level in New York. They were quite affluent. Household incomes, in many cases, you know, quite high. Though many did have debt or underemployment. Um, and they were somewhat more male than female. And anyway, this, there's a whole report that we published on this, which anybody who's interested in all the more details can look at. Um, and then the other thing was that the, it was very, this, this march included people of various ages, but um, the people, who, the millennials in the group, um, were much more involved. So they were the ones who had been, um, we counted the activities they might have done in Occupy. And they were much more likely to be actively involved, to have spent time overnight in an Occupy camp, to have posted on social media, to have been arrested, and so on. Um, here are a few, uh, you know, little excerpts. Um, a lot of Occupy people weren't working, or not working full time underemployed, biographically available. They had all sorts of talents and energies, a set of skills that allowed them to explode this out. And there's the fearlessness of young people. That actually applies to all four. Um, that was one of our interviewees. And then um, some of you probably know who David Graeber is, an anthropologist who 
takes credit for, uh, contested credit for having invented the slogan, we are the 99% and was very involved as a mentor to this um, movement when it first was being planned. Um, so he, I think he captures a little, this point very well when he says, the occupiers were young people bursting with energy with plenty of time on their hands, every reason to be angry, and access to the entire history of radical thought, with, you know, via the internet, et cetera. Um, where is the change we voted for? So that, you know, well, we didn't quite find this in our, Graeber argues this, that they were um, dis politically disillusioned after 2008. And we asked about that in our study, and some were. Um, many of them had been radicalized before 2008. But in any case, there was an element that definitely um, were acting on the false promise of the 2008 election. Um, as, you, as, as they're famous for their prefigurative politics and their horizontalism. So there was some storytelling a la dreamers, the Tumblr stories of dead and so on. And, and uh, when um, Occupy Sandy came along with Superstorm Sandy, um, there was more of that. But this was sort of more tangential for Occupy than for the dreamers. Um, and the main thing is they completely rejected conventional politics. They, um, for them, formal demands of any kind were verboten. That was not what they were about. And they, as you know, they were devoted to horizontalism was the phrase they used. as sort of ritualized consensus-based decision-making, ritualized with, do people know all this already? I assume we do. Okay. Um, and this was prefigurative politics. That is trying to prefigure now the society you want to have. So the occupations everywhere, starting in New York, and actually this was a replication of what had happened in Southern Europe and, in, and elsewhere. Um, they were, they created, you know, um, food, provision, housing obviously, medical care, education, a library, um, security, um, all kinds of things, you know, in the occupied spaces. So the idea was this is the society we want to build. Um, they also had a very global orientation, so they, um, there was a um, brilliant uh, moment when a bunch of the Occupy Wall Street folks published something called the Occupy Wall Street Journal, I don't know if this made its way to Madison, it was a, you know, a, a printed newspaper, and the centerfold of the first issue was a timeline of all the predecessor movements, so starting with the Arab Spring. I don't think Madison was in there, but it probably should have been, it was more, they were focused on um, Southern Europe and the Arab Spring, but, and, and also, this is not in the centerfold, but besides Madison, another um, predecessor was the anti-globalization movements of um, the late 1990s, especially Seattle in 1999, and in fact, the mentors to this movement, a lot of them were veterans of all that. Um, I'm not going to get into this, but the, Occupy appeared as a spontaneous event, but in fact was carefully planned in the months preceding the initial occupation, and a lot of the trainings and all were done by those anti-globalization folks. Um, and many of them were anarchists, or uh, manarchists, as uh, some people came to call them, because there was a certain amount of uh, gender warfare there um, later. So the irony for me here is that although storytelling was not really very important for, as a strategy for this movement, unlike the Dreamers, their real impact was, in fact, um, putting inequality into the national political conversation in a big way, um, which, it, you know, in rooms like this, everybody was already well aware of growing inequality, but not the general public. And since 2011, um, you can't have a political conversation without this word being uttered. It's really changed um, the conversation. So here's some uh, evidence for that. Just in news mentions of income inequality, you can see it spikes first in the time of Occupy, then declines a little, although not to the level preceding. And then, you know, actually, this could be updated in the current election season, too. I'm sure you've seen that spike, but I haven't done that yet. Um, and as I keep saying, it was an anti-systemic movement. This is one of my favorite um, posters from the New York Occupy. And this is not unusual. There was a lot. Of, isn't that great? <laughs> but there was a lot of talk about capitalism. Obviously, I mean, well, this is not just this one poster, right? That was sort of, you know, this is an anti-systemic, anti-capitalist movement, and and very explicitly so. Um, all right, moving right along, I want to now switch gears and talk a little bit about the anti-sexual violence movement. So this one is yet another variation on my theme. 
these are insiders, mostly white, mostly at elite colleges, playing the inside game that is interested in concrete reforms. Um, so it's a campus-based movement, therefore almost by definition millennial driven. These are, so if Black Lives Matter, which I'll get to in a moment, is about, the, you know, a reaction to the so-called post-racial society, this is post-feminist society. These are women who grow up with this expectation that, you know, gender equality has been achieved and it's all, they just have to do their part and it's all waiting for them. And they anticipate college in particular with enormous enthusiasm. Have any of you seen the film The Hunting Ground? Which shows this very vividly. So these, you know, that, that film shows all these examples of these women who are so excited they get into the college of their dreams. They get there and then experience rape. They call it sexual assault. I like the word rape, which is really what it is. In most cases, though, there are other kinds of sexual assault. Um, and find that this, the administrators that they uh, report these events to don't want to hear about it, are completely unresponsive for systematic reasons, it turns out. But um, so, so they organize. And um, they do, like the other groups I mentioned, they do get some mentoring, mostly from uh, female, often feminist faculty who are older, but they basically do this themselves. Um, I mentioned, well, I guess I already mentioned this. Um, it's in a, this is all happening in a, sexual assault is not new. It's been, you know, quite extensively documented, but the movement against it is relatively new. And um, I don't exactly know why that is, but it, one piece of the answer, I think, is that there's a lot of other political activity happening on these campuses, and so they feed each other. Um, as this interviewee said it to us, right at the time when we filed the sexual assault complaint, lots of other activists started coming forward about other things. Sort of like everything exploded at once. So I'm not sure how typical that is, but there's something like that going on. Um, they are largely, it's striking how um, at least the people featured in news accounts are overwhelmingly white and you know, privileged in the sense that they're at elite campuses. Um, one of our interviewees said women of color are underrepresented, and she said they're even more underrepresented in the media accounts than in the movement, but that they're also underrepresented in the movement. Um, and that's, I, you know, there aren't really data on this, but that's my impression too from looking at it a little bit more carefully. Um, most of them did, did not see themselves as feminists, quote unquote. In fact, that was, you know, a word that many rejected before this all um, developed. Um, one interviewee says, said, said, when I got to campus freshman year, freshman year, <laughs> there was an activities fair and there was a table for, I'm not naming her college because I would tell you who she is, for, <coughs> you know, blank feminists. And I remember I went up and picked up their information just so I could make fun of it. I thought it was so stupid because obviously women have equal rights and I didn't feel there was any purpose in feminism at that point. That's pretty typical. Um, they did use storytelling. You may have heard of the Mattress Girl, so-called. This is Emma Solkowitz at Columbia University, who, um, after complaining of sexual assault and getting no <coughs> response, started carrying a mattress around the campus. And well, she was in many magazines, including New York Magazine. Um, they too used social media extensively, but here it's a little more complex, maybe. Um, they used it for all kinds of things, not just organizing, but also creating. There are all these like private um, Facebook groups and things like that where they can talk to each other. Um, so as this interviewee put it, the internet has created a lot of spaces for people to talk with some semblance of privacy or anonymity about things that are traditionally seen as very shameful. This is actually very helpful in breaking down some of the shame because, you know, so this is classic sort of feminist consciousness raising language because when you realize that there are many other people with similar experiences, it's easier to move forward. But then she says, this is the same person, I definitely use social media a lot. That was positive in that a lot of people were seeing what I had to say. It was negative in that it made me a target of a lot of harassment. So one thing I've been doing, um, I'm not really done with this yet, but um, more for Black Lives Matter than the others, but um, is gathering names from media accounts of the movement and then looking the people up on Facebook to see you know, who they are. are they? And, and with Black Lives Matter, it's really quite easy to do, and there's hundreds of them, and they're overwhelmingly college educated, overwhelmingly female, and you know, where they do um, reveal their sexual orientation or expression, it's, it's queer um, in like half of the cases of the people who are cited frequently in the media. We tried to do the same thing with this movement. They don't tell you anything about their sexual orientation. Well, not surprising given what they've been through, but 
So I don't know. But, um, and they do get a lot of harassment online. So it's kind of like, one interview, there's only one person, though I haven't done that many interviews, claimed that this group, too, is disproportionately queer. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but anyway, some of them are. She came out in 10th grade as a lesbian. And um, her argument, well, her claim was that bisexual women are more often targeted by sexual predators and that some people change their sexual identity after this happens to them. Anyway, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's an interesting possibility. Um, anyway, this or these organizers focus on the inside game again. Getting laws passed, getting laws enforced that already exist, especially Title IX and the Cleary Act, which is this thing that is about campus safety that and was named after a victim of sexual assault years ago. Um, they spend a lot of time focused on campus procedures for addressing complaints, as you've probably heard. I don't know if this is happening here in Madison much. So those, those procedures often exist, but turn out to be not that effective, and they're a big point of controversy on all sides. New laws in California, there was a yes means yes law passed by the state legislature. Um, one activist told us, that's actually been a criticism, that we've been too focused on just adhering to the law and not a better vision of what's possible, that they're seen a, you know, by the other, their allies as sort of too conservative that way. Um, but a lot, they got a lot of traction on the reform front, as you, you know, you've, I'm sure you've all heard. Um, tremendous press, tremendous attention from elected officials, and some attention from college administrators. I mean, that film, The Hunting Ground, really sort of shows the systemic ways in which college administrators have an interest in not addressing these issues because it gives their campuses bad PR and then parents don't want to send their kids to these places. You know, this is true everywhere. So there's a, that's a whole crazy dynamic. But in everywhere else, these women are getting a lot of responsiveness. So in that sense, it's a lot like the Dreamers. They, you know, they've won some concrete concessions here and there, although it's all very contested. All right. Um, talking too long, so let me just turn to Black Lives Matter very briefly, and I'm sure you know more about that anyway, since it's in the news every five minutes. Um, again, these are outsiders playing the outside game. They're African Americans, and by definition, outsiders, they are um, overwhelmingly millennials, as I told you about my little approach to trying to figure this out, overwhelmingly college educated, and of course they are, this is the generation that grew up in supposedly a post-racial society with an African American president who they voted for, in many cases. Um, yet, they're affected by things like the Great Recession as well as all kinds of um, microaggression as people of color, racial profiling, violence, from police, I know you all know this. Um, this movement really started um, with the acquittal of George Zimmerman in Florida, if you remember that. There was a group called Dream Defenders, which still exists, which sort of emerged first. And, you know, I noticed that, probably some of you did too, but it really exploded after Ferguson, of course. So, um, but it's been building up for a while. Um, one commentator said, this is not your grandfather's civil rights movement. So what does that mean? It's sort of, um, well, there are many things it means. They too got some mentoring from older activists from the old civil rights movement, but they, like Occupy, though not in as extreme a way, tend to reject the sort of conventional hierarchies they see themselves as leaderful. There are leaders, of course, but um, they are interested in being more democratic than they see traditional organizations as being. They, too, use social media extensively. Um, the hashtag itself, which was invented by three experienced activists, um, is an example of that. But even before that, that that's sort of just what goes without saying that that's central to how they organize. Um, they talk endlessly about intersectionality as well. Again, the leadership is disproportionately queer and female. Um, so, I don't know, this is a little uh, too cute probably, but they, this is a quote from Alicia Garza, who's one of those three women who invented the hashtag. The model of the black preacher leading people to the promised land isn't working right now. So, that she's interested in a more grassroots sort of orientation as are many of the others. Um, people think we're engaged with identity politics. The truth is, this is, this is a, inter, a different version of intersectionality. She is a labor organizer, doing what the labor movement has always done, organizing people who are at the bottom. So they insist on, whether it's really accurate or not is another question, but the rhetoric is of a grassroots intersectionality-based movement. Um, all right, so let me just wrap up. So, um, 
so the dreamers and the, and the anti-sexual assault movements both rely on this sort of conventional demands and storytelling, what I'm calling the inside game. And they've been fairly successful in that respect, um, but uh, they, they haven't done much to change the conversation. The opposite is true for Occupy and Black Lives Matter, who, which have had a lot of impact at the discursive level. They have um, made people much more aware of problems of ongoing police violence against um, people of color, et cetera, as well as of inequality. But nothing's changed much in either front in terms of actual practice. So that's where I'm at with this, and I'll just stop there. Thanks. So I'm going to get a piece of paper out here, so I'm going to write down whatever you have to say. Anybody have any questions, comments, whatever? Okay. So I have a question about the insider-outsider strategy. Can you talk about or so I can hear you? So I have a question about the insider-outsider strategy. To what extent does that reflect the openness of particularly democratic politicians to supporting the um, or people in power, maybe not just Democratic politicians, to supporting the goals of the movement. So for, um, I mean, Wisconsin was one of the universities that was under, um, under federal investigation for not protecting women under Title IX. And there were absolutely senior women faculty who were very involved in helping young women through mm -hmm. the process and raising charges. So, I mean, they clearly found sympathetic people who were very powerful, who could choose inside games because um, they were already in positions of power. Um, with the Dreamers, Democratic politicians who wanted Hispanic votes absolutely worked with young Dreamers and proposed pretty pragmatic policies. As opposed to Black Lives Matter and Occupy, which actually the change in the conversation had to come before they could get anyone to work with them on policy. And I just, well, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. That's an interesting idea. I'm mean, just thinking about who their allies were right. at the outset and how much it was a reframing. How much they could easily access people already in power. I mean, I don't think it, it works for those two. I'm not sure. Like Obama recently invited the Black Lives Matter people to the White House, and a couple of people did accept. That guy who's running for mayor in Baltimore, for example, went, and other people said, "No, we don't want to talk to him. This is not going to work. This is not what we're about." So, I mean, so there's a little bit of a division about this, but they had that access too, and they rejected it. And Occupy too had many operating. Even the Democratic Party tried to co-opt it and many, and, you know, move on and so on, and they didn't want anything to do with that. So I don't know. I mean. I'm not sure that explains it. That is an interesting angle, though. I mean, that's something to think about. Well, I'm just saying, um, with Black Lives Matter, it was really clear in Madison where someone was killed that our socialist mayor could not go against the police union. Like, could not. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's it's a much more structural challenge than, you know, asking for, I mean, I don't know. I think getting undocumented people legal status is, you know, is a fairly radical demand too, but it's much more doable. You're not going up against like the fundamental social structure if you do that. There would be political opposition, obviously, but it's not. You know, it's really different than this. And same with inequality. So, well, I don't know. I think it's the agendas are different, and the um, and the you know the sort of reception is different. I guess they both matter, but I'm not sure that really explains the demand. I don't know. Maybe that's a good point. I, I, as you know, I love two by two tables <laughs> because of the way they force you to think about dimensions of problems. Uh, two of the movements are concerned with violence. Yes, that's another two by two table. I that's agree. Another, yeah. And two two different ones. Two are two are, two are two, not. Yeah. And two are concerned with, in effect, um, inclusions in in the economy. I mean, the, mm -hmm. The, the DREAM Act is not, of course it's about citizenship, but it's really about full inclusion into the economic structure. And the social structure. Yeah. The social structure. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. So there, there's a, there is another dimension going on here. Absolutely. 
around the, the violence stuff. Also, the, the Black Lives Matter is a peculiar combination of very specific demands. I mean, they make demands, we want such and such a police officer charged. That's true. Yeah. So it's a, and we want the world changed. Um, whereas the Occupy movement was really not about demands. And a somewhat perplexing refusal to even have sy unrealistic system demands. You know, it wasn't, you know, unlike earlier revolutionary system rejectionists, you know, who didn't want to work within the system and had utopian demand, they didn't even want to, you know, say anything about what they wanted. Although a bunch of them are working for Bernie, I should have mentioned. That yeah. they, and explicitly so, they say occupy Wall Street people for Bernie. So there's now, it's now, sort of, yeah. so these, and same with um, Black Lives Matter has a little bit of division internally about this too. But, but for the most part, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, sometimes the Occupy things seem to seem more just an expressive movement rather than actually a social change movement because of that absolute refusal to talk about alternatives. They practiced a kind of micro-alternative, but mm -hmm. there was, so it was this, it was, a, it's kind of perplexing in the usual, in terms of the usual way we think about so, getting back to your thing about inclusions, I guess what you're calling include, I when I say that people are outsiders that want to be let in, that's what I'm talking about. That, in other words, so for yeah. both the uh, um, undocumented the and the black but, lives but matter. But the free. sexual, the, the violence thing. Oh, that's different. But the, yeah. uh, the sexual violence thing is, you, you said they were kicked out. It, it, it seems like that they, we did everything right, but we've been excluded. It's it's so focused on the sexual violence issue. It's not about glass ceilings. That mm -hmm. doesn't get brought up. That's true. So it's not so much about the opportunity side of this. It's about the treatment side, mm -hmm. which is a different. Although for many women, it's a feeling of being not comfortable on campus. Because sure. A... Yeah. Well, and being rejected by the. I mean, it's true that they get these female mentors from the faculty in many places, but the administration. Right, I know, but the, but the female yeah. faculty told. Yeah, yeah. No. But often, I mean, yeah, and it's that's the structural piece, right? That it's, the administration is just not going. Well, right. particularly is not removing the violator from the classroom that the student has to sit in, which is a huge issue. There's a million issues, and it, and it's complicated. But the, I think the structural piece is that it's just, it's really not in their interest to do anything about it, the administrators, because it hurts their own campus's reputation. So there's a so that film interviews. Um, former administrators who are basically told that they are told that they can't do anything about this. Basically, I mean, you know, but, and that it would, you know, it would hurt their football team. It would hurt the, their recruitment efforts to get students to, you know, if they're supposed to advertise that they've had rapes on campus, and then and then the kids come through to look at the camp, you know, that whole thing. So there's, there's all these things that drive them to suppress it. And then there's there are real issues too in terms of what is the right procedure. You know, it's not simple um, how you have due process for people who are accused of this, and also real justice for the uh, victims, right? It's not, it's not simple. Um, I, when it first started, I was myself one of the people who said, well, like, why don't they just go to the police, you know? Like, what is, why are university administrations mixed up in this? So I now get that, but um, there is that angle, too. And some of them do do that, but that's got its own problems. Yeah, so. Oh, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I, I really liked the, uh, the scheme. I think it makes a lot of sense. Especially in relation to how the movements built on each other. I mean, just speaking anecdotally from being an activist in New York at this time, one thing that I think was a big connection was the Black Lives Matter protests with Eric Gardner. I think were a lot more aggressive than they would have been if people hadn't gone through Occupy. Uh huh. And many of the same people participated. Sure. Like I remember the activities we were thought were possible before and afterwards with just the general public. Like people weren't scared as scared. More, more willing to take aggressive stuff. Um, so, wanna, I, I wanted to know if, given your research, if you'd looked at a little more of the underlying networks, like the support networks for these groups. So, like the money that labor was giving to Occupy, and you know, there's been some pushback that some of the Black Lives Matter people are working at the behest of Teach for America. Um, oh, I haven't run across that, really? Like the guy running in Baltimore, all the money is coming from TFA. Okay. Um, but anyway, so, uh, yeah. Um, and I, I guess, in, especially in relation to, like, if you've done any follow-up with the 
people from your Occupy study, like where have they gone now? A little bit. I mean, not for the 700 and some that we surveyed. We have no way to reach them. But um, we did look at where the, um, we did a smaller number of in-depth interviews. So yeah, a lot of them have remained active. Some of them were already activists, to be fair. So it's a small group. Um, a lot of them have gone into the labor movement, which is one of the few places you can actually get paid to do stuff. But um, yeah, it varies. And some of them are in graduate school <laughs> in various places. So, yeah. Um, we called our report changing the subject for two reasons. One was the obvious thing that everybody says about changing the conversation and all, which they did do. But the idea was also that it was, you know, creating a set of new political subjects. And I think that at least for some that is the case. So, you know, our interviews were, some, were kind of a, they had no leaders officially, right? So we just tried to identify people we knew were very uh, involved. And um, it was kind of arbitrary. But um, some of them were newly radicalized by this effort and, you know, that's something, and, and we have remained um, activists ever since, but it's a tiny number of people. Um, that, we did look at them on Facebook too, by the way, and the, you know, queer women thing is not the case for Occupy, as far as we can tell. I mean, that's just not a feature of it. It's not that it's zero people are like that, but that's not, it doesn't stick out like it does for the others. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, like outsiders versus insiders and uh, like um, how you we were mentioning how the you know dreamers are able to get um, Democrats and, and politicians on their side whereas Black Lives Matter not so much. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with sort of like how Black Lives Matter movement because it's like anti-racist. I would argue that um, you know the United States has re um, relied on racism to divide the working class specifically um, for all of its history right so like a, a fight against racism is something that's like fundamentally anti-systematic, whereas, like, and, and I would even argue the, the... That's what I'm arguing, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and the reforms that you put up there for the, the Dreamers one, for instance, they almost, uh, like, the ones, a few of them were things that sort of, like, preserved the idea of, um, of the nuclear family, um, where, where it, it seemed like the, the ones with the children and, like, the parents, um, it sort of seems like the system and, the, and the, the status quo, people who are in charge are, able, are, are willing to move on things that like to kind of um, you know benefit them too. They need to preserve the the you know the, the narrative of, of the nuclear family. And then I, I also wanted to mention, uh, oh yeah, the, the the that goes along with like how um, recently the Black Lives Matter movement. I, I think it was Brown Zero, or I don't remember which organization, but one of the one of the national ones. You know, they they were quoted as being like one of the most um, one one of the top like 20 tech firms um, in in uh, Silicon Valley that has like political influence in, in the in the presidential campaign, so there's definitely that um, happening in the Black Lives Matter movement as well. And then uh, also, just real quick, wanted to talk about the reason why we see um, queer black women as, as leaders in the Black Lives Matter movement. I would argue that like people who participate in the Black Lives Matter movement are like from all walks. I think you just mentioned that, right? Um, but like the, the leaders, uh, I think it has led a lot to do with like the this history of black nationalism and sort of. Um, like how racist like movements and, and labor union movements have been to black people entering them and so look sort of historically in times when there's not a lot of solidarity between white and black workers um, black folks tend to want to um, organize all black folks to perfectly understandably and I support their right to do that um, and then on the other other um, side you have like identity politics I think that are very prevalent now um, and that has to do with the fact that we've We've had such a, a drought, a glut of, of social movements, and so like academic theories have become prevalent and made their way into movements. And so like the the white allies, right? So they see they're they're them seeing like um, the person's identity as being more important than their politics causes them to sort of step back from leadership positions. So like I think the two things um, are working in tandem to and that's like why you see leaders of queer white women. Hmm. I'd be really interested in other people's thoughts on that too, because I, I I find yeah the Thank you. Yep. No question, I gather that. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in two things that you that you mentioned. One is the mentorship and how these mentorship processes actually work. Is there conflict between generations in terms of theory of change and tactics? And what kinds of what do those conversations look like? The quote about not your grandfather's civil rights movement. There was a New Yorker piece. There was, I mean, an interesting discussion about that's John John Jelani Cobb's piece, right? That's yeah. where I got that quote oh, from, actually. Yeah. yeah. So we're reading um, the same things, right. Uh, so I'm interested in what you found about mentorship. Um, I'm also interested in, so you mentioned Camp Obama, and this is something I've sort of experienced, is the diffusion of tactics, and to what extent, 
So public narrative, storytelling, um, what is the sort of, I don't want to say professionalization process, but often, but there are organizations in place that are kind of professionalizing activists in a way. And I think public narrative or storytelling is a really good example. You're talking about explicit training, um, learning how to tell your story yourself and share it with the media, media training, mm -hmm. how to maximize your Facebook. I mean, what kinds of those, um, I won't, there's another word for it, but I, like professionalization activities are these activists engaging in? And are you seeing any kind of variation across? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm not sure I can answer it fully. Uh, the, the storytelling is the really explicit one for the dreamers. I mean, they literally were trained in telling this exact story, you know, by the um, older immigrant rights movement that, that sort of incubated the whole dreamers thing. And then over time, I mean, you know, the best account of this is that book by Walter Nichols, it's called The Dreamers, that sort of describes the process as over time they begin to rebel against that. Um, but yeah, the others, so I think Black Lives Matter has grown so quickly that even though the older generation, the survivors of, so to speak, of the older generation of civil rights movement, of course, you know, supported and tried to be there for, you know, th there wasn't that much receptivity to that, and that these were kids, if I can say that way, who, you know, sort of thought they knew how to do it themselves and really took off on their own, and really rejected a lot of that right away. Um, so it's different, I, I don't know, and then, but I, I think it's messy. I mean, I don't think it's that simple, and there are divisions among all of them, too. So then the, the mentorship for the sexual assault stuff is more what Gay described, I think. It wasn't like explicit mentorship of a movement, but like you're casting around looking for somebody to help you with this, and the administration is not that agency, and so you know you, turn, you show up on some sympathetic doorstep of one of your professors who teaches women's studies or something. I mean, That's exactly what I was describing. No, it's <laughs> everywhere it's like that. So there's a lot of that, but that, I mean, you could call that mentorship, but it's, it's more desperation almost. I mean, it's not really the same as the others where there's like an explicit project to incubate this. And I don't think Black Lives Matter was incubated either. It just sort of exploded. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I think I, I have read a lot of the social movements literature, which I find sort of, I hope I'm not insulting anybody here, uh, kind of strikingly unhelpful in figuring this out. Like it doesn't really, and I'm not sure why. I mean, I think it is really hard to, none of us predicted these things. I myself remember actually in the spring where, um, your state capital was being occupied. That was sort of exciting, but then it was basically defeated. And I, um, I remember being incredibly depressed about politics in the spring of 2011 after that happened. And I think, and I was part of some. I mean, this is sort of. I'm sorry. This is sort of. I'm being narcissistic here, but I was part of some group that wanted to have a conversation about the future of the labor movement, given what happened here in Wisconsin. And you know, we thought, you know, now the public sector unions were dead too, and it was all over. And and then a few months later, along comes Occupy, and it's like completely transformed all of our views of what was possible. You know, nobody expected this to happen. Even the occupiers themselves that we interviewed, every single one of them, said, well, we thought we'd be, you know, evicted immediately. Like, we didn't expect this to go on for months. Mm -hmm. So you can't predict this stuff. And so I, you know, so I still don't fully understand, like, where do these things come from? Like, sexual assault has been going on for a long time. There's a lot of evidence about it over decades. So why now is there a movement against it finally, right? Um, Black Lives Matter, you could say the same thing. I mean, I remember the Rodney King thing in 1992. So there was this brief explosion of activity and then nothing, basically, for till now. So, so I don't know. I don't have a good explanation for this. But, but it is striking that they're all, they are building on one. And I think what, what – I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Andrew. What, Andy? Andrew. Said Andrew. What, what, what you said is really important in terms of the – I think people do – are influenced by the success of the uh, they see. Uh, Black Lives Matter for sure sees that all this other stuff is happening so they can do it too. You know, there's definitely some of that here. But how these, if we're gonna call it sexual <coughs> protests, how these sort of you know get traction isn't clear to me. So um yeah. Yeah, um so I, I have a question about the dreamers. Okay. Because maybe a, another distinction about them is that there is also a bigger, broader immigrant rights. Absolutely. Movement, yeah. Which may be which did incubate them. Which yeah. is especially yeah. powerful by comparison to any of these other issues. That there's a broader movement that's really had some serious um, mobilization that's been going on for some time. And, what, and I know that there's been tension, right? Mm -hmm. Between that broader movement and the Dreamers insofar as the Dreamers 
are asking for particular demands that are that have a certain class character to them, that they're asking for education, uh, or that the that the, the the benefits will go to people who get a college education or who are in college. Well, As they a, didn't draft the law that has been proposed, but anyway, yeah. But I, the, 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 the end, the, like the, the, the demands get wrapped up in that kind mm -hmm. of sort of narrow segment of the broader immigrant population. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering to what degree the the sort of shift that you mentioned um, take took into account that critique and whether they were influenced not so much by an older generation of mentors, but rather by this bigger movement that so helped to shape that movement. So 2006 is the peak of that movement, as, as a movement, as opposed to a sort of, you know, political lobbying group or something. There are all these immigrant rights groups that are out, you know, in D.C. or whatever that are, have been pushing for this legislation for a long time and so on. But the, the only sort of social movement moment of that, that, well, it's not the only one, but the major one was those big marches in 2006, remember that? Mm -hmm. And um, and then, and those were kind of organized by the right wing, a little bit like what happened here in 2011. That is, you know, there was this Sunstone Brenner bill that, do you remember this? I was, I yeah. through this very, um, I was very involved at the time. So, um, there, that would have made it a felony to be president in the country without papers, which now it's a civil offense. So, that's what sparked that movement. And it sort of, I mean, Sunstone Brenner didn't pass, it kind of had some limited success. A lot of people, but then it sort of falls apart. Right? So, you see the and movement of having become weak then? Well, it's more, it's just at an impasse, you know, they, the country's completely polarized over this issue. There's this sort of cycle of reactive politics on both sides. We're seeing it with the Trump stuff now. Right? And so, but as a movement, it's sort of retreated. And, you know, Obama is, the advocates call him the deporter-in-chief. He's deported. He did that because he thought it would pave the way to comprehensive immigration reform, I believe. But nevertheless, they're pretty disgusted with all that, right? And the young people most of all. And they're... Unlike the older activists, some of whom have gotten status in various ways, and all, you know, these young people are like their whole lives are ahead of them, and they're blocked by this stuff. So they're, in, you know, they want something now. They don't want to carry the train of the whole thing, which was the kind of strategy that they accepted at the beginning. So it's really tough on them. Um, oh, they did get DACA, so that's helpful. But um, but in terms of the class thing, I don't think that's true of the movement as a whole. It is. It's just because of the way the Dream Act has been framed. It favors that group, but, and then the college, I think people, the college educated ones are the, you know, they're kind of the leading edge in all kinds of ways, and they also are more biographically available, et cetera, so it's not, it's probably no accident that they're in the forefront, but they're not, you know, the, the immigrant rights movement is for all, I'm talking all 11 million, not just for the college educated or something. Right. And they, and the dreamers themselves have now embraced that and said, we you know, we want, so that's for our parents too, not just for us. We don't want to. The, it's true what you said about the family thing, but that's more of a strategy than anything. I'm not, I don't. They're you know they're mostly queer. They don't. It's not like they're big believers in conventional family life or something. But this is a way to make the case that you know families should not be separated by the border, right? So they're using that um, conventional, you know, what's widely accepted by the wider population as an, as a way of appealing to for the sympathy from the public. It's not so much that they believe that stuff. But, but, you know, it's a strategy, I think. But. I was saying more that's why they're conceding, like the state is conceding those things. It hasn't conceded them, though, in fact. I mean, like they're just continuing to deport them. Yeah. Okay, right, sure. Yeah. But anyway, um, I don't know which of you was next, but whatever. Uh, just a, a thought on the issue of queer leadership. The other thing going on nationally in the arc of this period is, of course, the rapidity of the struggle around same-sex marriage, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in which uh, there's been a, among younger generations, a decline in the salience of sexual identity as an issue, not as a um, political issue to fight for, but as a, as a divisive mm -hmm. dimension. But within the black community, that's been slower. Yeah. And so... Makes it more all the more striking, and well, Latino but, community too. I mean, and right. so, so, but, yeah. so it may be that their struggles within those communities have given them, a, in a sense, more autonomy to. I mean, there's some kind of reactive thing going because the broader culture is allowing the, these expressions. That's been symbolically ratified at the elite level as well as the media level. And they are pretty elite, these people. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, at least they want to be. I mean, right. they're trying to Right, so yeah. they're, they're educated and articulate. They're, they're plugged into that set of 
issues yeah. as well. And it's out of whack with the kind of grassroots in their own immediate communities. So I wonder what you all think about this. Have people read like, this old text by Patricia Hill Collins about the outsider within? Like that's one thing that occurs to me, right. that maybe if you're queer, you're more sensitive to political marginalization too and more quick to feel that you need to fight back or something. I don't know. I don't I really but don't it's, know. But it's also possible that people that people of that generation, because gay rights issues have become more normalized, maybe people mm -hmm. are just more comfortable saying So less fearful like so you're suggesting be, about No, I'm saying it yeah. may not actually be a different represent a different set of numbers. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're more out. Well this can't be half. I mean well, anyway. Yeah, I, but you don't have a representative sample. Can I get something else on the table? Can I ask I don't have a representative sample, but I have a sample of people who are mentioned more than five times in the mainstream media, and like half of them who mention their sexual orientation are queer. That's a lot. I mean, it's got to be way out of proportion to the overall possibility, right? So, so but can I ask the other thing I was going to ask? Which is, um, you lock, so I totally agree with you about social movement theory in general. I think it focuses much more on it removes the content really often from movements and focuses mm -hmm. on mobilizing tactics rather than on content. And I think that generational issue that you mentioned is really worth um, focusing on more than cycles of protest because mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. combination of more people going to college from more different backgrounds, being more in debt, and having the 2008 crash and the rise of precarity seem like really important um, dynamics. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not mutually exclusive, of course. No, I mean, no, no, no. The argument is that that generation then creates this cycle. Part, but, uh, you know, anyway, yeah. Cycle part is just naming it, though. It doesn't really explain anything. But I think right. generations of protest actually resonated more in, as, in terms of thinking about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, too. But thanks. That's helpful. Yeah. Stacy? No, change my mind. Really? <laughs> You're not going to help me figure out the mystery? I just think in the case of a black, black, excuse me, a black lives matter. The marginalization of lesbians, the, the women's larger participation in college, just creates networks that are more mobilizable. Um, networks of friendships. It's really interesting. Hmm. Yeah, the disproportionate women in college is much higher among African Americans than. The, population as a whole. So you get Actually, that's true of the Latinos, too. Right, so that yeah. would be another, mm -hmm. another. And college is clearly crucial. That's like the crucible for a lot of this stuff. Maybe not Occupy, but all the others. Yeah. It really is. I mean, they all emerge from those environments. Yeah. Um, interesting. It can't, I, mean, I think there just has to be more to it, but that's a, a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, some of the puzzles might be misperceptions. I don't mean your misperception, but collective misperceptions, especially maybe even through news media. So for instance, with the with the queer identity, it might be, I don't know, but it might be that um, they're not queer in the sense of um, they're the fact that they're sexual partners of same sex. It might just be a rejection of standard sexuality categories that goes along with um, uh, yeah, there's some of that. to political yeah. marginalization, almost mm -hmm. the reverse of what Pat Collins says. Um, it may be that their actual sexual behavior is not all that different from heteronormativity. Um, now, that, that might, that's, a, that's a testable hypothesis. I mean, that might be wrong, but it's, it's a plausible story. In which case, um, it's just a, the, the, the meaning of queer is, uh, you know, can easily be misperceived in terms of describing particular sexual activities as opposed to, like, uh -huh. rejecting labels of sexual activities. Another um, uh, quick example of what might be a misperception, there's been um, a lot of that uh, organization against rape and sexual assault, including on college campuses, for a long time. It doesn't, I mean, is it, an, is it in fact a new way of organizing, or is it a more media savvy way of organizing? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, when I was an undergraduate in the early 2000s, I helped lead a, a, a rape and sexual assault effort on my own college campus, and we actually got a few changes to being everything we wanted, but we got some changes to how the administration responded to accusations. <laughs> Absolutely no media interest. We, we was all just local. Like, we didn't, maybe we should have used the media, but we never did. What about, did I you use social media, or was it before that? What? 2003 didn't exist. Um, so that may be part of it too. Yeah. So I mean, we didn't. Um, I, I suspect that there was a lot of that going on, and for whatever reason, there's now a lot of media interest in it. So 
Um, another testable question. Is this, in fact, a new thing, or is this something that's been going on for a long time? It's certainly bigger now. I'm sure you're right that there are, I mean, I myself have been involved in stuff like this back in the 70s, so, but it does seem to have taken off in a big way, in, you know, more than before, but, yeah, the question is why, yeah. It's not like there was no activity before, though. Well, actually, that's true of all these things, right, all four, well, maybe not Occupy, but the, these are not new phenomena, completely. you know, there's been agitation about police violence for a long time too, but not on this scale, right? So, anyway, but that's helpful. Um, Jake, you want to hear something? Oh, sorry, hi. Um, I was wondering where, if there's a story of sort of burnout in this, where, you know, of course, there are many individuals from Occupy who are off doing other things, but there's also a whole who were totally demobilized and, you know, said, you know, we, we gave it all we could for two months and then it didn't work, so screw it. Um, but uh, is there a story of kind of if we're talking about people who are new activists and um, even though they have mentorship uh, don't get what they want as soon as they expect you know I mean civil rights movement sort of took many 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 years and we're still kind of in a short time frame that we're looking yeah, at yeah, no, it's hard to know whether this is going to really continue to grow or just mm -hmm. peter out is that what you're saying yeah that's yeah, definitely yeah. possible I mean I don't think there's any way to I wouldn't venture to make any predictions, but both are possible, absolutely. I guess I'd like being a Pollyanna type. I like to think that it's going to continue to grow, but there's no way to know that. Yeah. Ruth, one thought just occurred to me that um, in the 60s, you know, Todd Gitlin wrote the book, The Whole World is Watching, uh -huh. about how the media mm -hmm. the amplifies media it all. Yeah. Amplify things. Mm -hmm. What was striking in the 80s. Yeah was that the media learned to ignore things. So when, when the, when the um, university chancellor's office was occupied here for a week, and 50 people, 200, 50 people were arrested, 200, and there was a lot of arrests, it didn't make the New York Times. That was pre, but that was pre-social media. Mm. So what we have is in the 60s, people used the public media and the media went along with it. Between you know, when that movement died down, then in the 80s and the 90s, the media just ignored these things. There was a lot of things happening around anti-apartheid and around Nicaragua, and then where university campuses were, uh, chancellor's offices were occupied, all sorts of stuff. And now there's a way to get publicity without relying. And then the, me then the public media is forced to pay attention to it because it's gotten, so maybe, that is part so of it. So maybe the social media drives the regular the media, regular the old media, media into um, act. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So there's just a whole there's a whole new communication structure in place that then returns us to the and then it grows more, right? I mean, that's right. what you see is when there is media attention, then people hear about it and they want to be part of it. Right. Like we've seen that in all of these cases. But so, that's, so there's another yeah. way of yeah, getting. I'm going to say there was media on the anti I mean, I actually just, think you, I, I, would, oh, I think you want to be careful with no, this. No, but it was. There For was relatively a lot speaking, of, a lot, yeah. there was a lot of instances where things were ignored in the way they wouldn't have been a Well, because but there was sort of repertoire of contention got very ordinary. But that doesn't. I mean, it would. Um, so I think it's probably true that Occupy wouldn't have drawn attention without social media because it was a pretty ragtaggle camp the first right. couple of months. But there were just not a lot of people there. From, it was a couple of days, you mean, not months. It only was two months. Well, I know, but the, it was not days, but the weeks. But I thought it was only when they had the run-in with the police on the Brooklyn Bridge that they really started to get a lot of attention. It's true. I was just thinking that when Erica was speaking, that the, in Occupy's case, it was actually not so much the media as the police. It was the police and, and, and social media. Their idiocy of, you know, the way they responded actually ended up, combined with the yeah. social media but It just happens that I was at Occupy that morning before that demonstration, before I had to catch a plane, so I wasn't there for the demonstration, and it was really ragtag and really small, and that it was just amazing. No, for the first few days there was no media attention, and then it grew. Yeah, yeah that's true. Attacked that girl. Okay. Sorry? It was after they attacked, there was, there was a girl who was like trying to leave the protest, the cops like surrounded her and sprayed her with... The pepper spray thing, that's, that's right. But then there was and then the Brooklyn Bridge. bridge. And, and, but, but also, the police chose not to evict them right away. I think the police are a hugely underestimated factor in that particular story. Because the, the, the actors themselves expected to be kicked out immediately. Like they had been the spring before with Bloombergville. And 
which was, you've never heard of probably, but it was a similar kind of effort to occupy some public space in New York. And, you know, and that was like, ended immediately. And then, I mean, I guess they were there for a week or something, but then they were kicked out and that was the end of it. And nobody ever heard about it. It was like the things you were just talking about. They looked out that it was because the protesters didn't realize that wasn't actually a public park. So it was, it was a public private so the cops park. Couldn't, yeah. the, the cops couldn't kick them off without getting the building's approval. But then the building had this weird thing where it was like private but quasi public. So yeah. there was a whole debate that allowed them to stay longer than they were. Yeah. But, but they themselves didn't understand that. No, so, I mean, there were all these sort of serendipitous developments. And then in the end, yeah, the media ended up being really important, but it was. A lot driven by this sort of so you know this is what I mean about the unpredictability of this stuff and maybe if none of that had happened who knows if these I mean there's no way to know but it's um yeah but I think I still think the point about social media fueling old media is really a key part of all this in all these cases actually.